Hey everybody, this is Ross. In um, today's video, I thought I'd give you guys some insight on my perspective on what characteristics I look for when selecting a new fig variety to grow, or also what characteristics I personally prefer in the varieties that I currently possess. And what I consider my keepers, what are the characteristics that determine that? What are the characteristics that really make or break some varieties into my top five, my top 10. We did do some videos quite recently on my favorite figs. That was a really good video, my top five, my top 10. That really broke down a lot of the characteristics that I look for. Um, we also did some videos recently talking about my coal lists or the varieties that I've gotten rid of over the past for various different reasons and we went into those reasons. We went over the list that we got rid of in 2017. Also three weeks ago, we got rid of, um, we did a video talking about the varieties we got rid of in 2019. So between those three videos and in addition to this one, I think you guys are gonna get some really great perspective, um, a great starting point. But there is already a great starting point already out there. You just have to look, you have to make some friends. Join our figs. Make friends on rfigs.com. Um, there is specifically though, make a friend that has at least three to five years of experience growing figs um, and a wide variety of figs and speak to them. Hopefully they're local. Find out, find someone local with those years of experience and find out what they really like. That's a great starting point. You can't argue with that. Genetics and varieties are so, so important. They can really make a huge difference in your climate, in your season. It's a big deal. And um, that's sort of why we, we grow so many different varieties and why I've trialed so many different varieties over the past, to find the superior varieties that are a lot less hassle, less work, um, and taste better. So. Um, let me talk to you guys now about the characteristics that I look for. In my spreadsheet here, you can find a list of varieties that I recommend for a climate similar to mine. Uh, I'm in the Northeast, outside of Philadelphia. It's, uh, it's pretty warm here in the summer, but we have a short summer, uh, a short, really a short window for figs. Our falls are very cool and our spring is very cool. So we have to make up for it in the summer. We only have about six months of frost-free days. Um, we also get about 40 inches of rain annually. That is really the biggest killer here though, is the length of our season and the amount of rain that we get during our summer, during the fig ripening uh, process. So uh, I think the most obvious characteristic and one that's unfortunately overlooked by a lot of new people is the ripening period. When does the fig ripen? If you don't know, you can ask, you can find out very easily, just do a search on our figs. Um, so for me here in my climate, 180 days, if you guys have a climate similar, 180 days, you can ripen a lot of mid season or early season varieties. What you can't ripen is the majority of the late season varieties. You need some sort of head start, a greenhouse, waking them up early for them to ripen in your climate, in your season. You don't have that, it's almost a waste of time. And um, I know a lot of you guys wanna taste these different really exotic tasting figs, but you may not ever get any, uh, especially if you have less days in your season than I do. Um, you know, if you have 150 days, forget about late season varieties. Just forget about it. Um, it's just not going to work. So, um, you know, that's a big one, but, and it may seem obvious, but uh, you wouldn't believe how many people just completely ignore what I just said. Um, all right. So, the number two, the most, second most important thing, or in my mind, the most important thing here for me is the rain resistance because we're trying to achieve the highest fruit quality possible. I'm not just trying to ripen as many figs as I can. Um, you know, I get a lot of figs. I can't eat them all, right? Um, what I am looking for is that experience when I eat a fig and just say, wow, I'm, a, I'm impressed. 
nature is amazing um, you have this moment where it's for the experience um, it's a challenge growing figs here and uh, it wouldn't be worth it unless I had those experiences so I'm, I'm looking for that I'm looking for the highest fruit quality possible and also the um, consistent a consistent fruit quality if I have no rain here we have low humidity and I have a dry period of about 10 days the temperatures are in the 90s or the high 80s pretty consistently during that period I will have the highest quality I can ripen here in this climate and it happens every year or most years for about a week or two and then that's about it it sort of falls off a little bit of a cliff after that point um, but there's some things you can do if you have the right varieties specifically you can continue that um, that fruit quality for an extended period of time and uh, like I said rain resistance is the key however it's not necessarily rain resistance it's a little bit more deeper than that thought or that term so uh, one of the varieties and some of the varieties that I really highly recommend are things like uh, Neruciola de Elba um, so if I type in my Elba fig here, <clears throat> this is a fig that really easily dries up on the tree. We also have uh, Verdino del Nord. And this is another one that really easily dries up on the tree. Let me find you guys a good photo of this so that this maybe makes a bit more sense in everybody's head here. Here we go. So this is a actually taken, this photo was taken on a day that was the best fruit quality day I had all year in 2019. This was taken on, no, uh, not November. This is when I uploaded the photo. I'll have to find out the exact day, but this was probably sometime in August. Um, I got the watering correct. It was a dry period, uh, as I mentioned everything kind of worked out perfectly and the majority of the figs you see on this this thing here this table and this photo ended up drying up on the tree um, when they can dry up on the tree they have a better fruit quality to them uh, the flavor intensifies it has a higher bricks um, you can see them all right here on the table you can see some of them very clearly have been dried there at least a lot of them are, are shriveling up, especially the Neruciola de Elba. And if I zoom in, you can see here Sucret, a lot of them are semi-dried here. Here's the Neruciola de Elba. Here's the insides. And the only way that I was able to achieve this with the majority of these outside of this particular moment was to have varieties that can reliably dry on the tree and even in my climate where it really seems to be difficult to have certain things dry up on the tree I'm able to get Neruciola de Elba, Ferdino del Nord, um, Sucret, even Moro de Caneva. Let's see, what are some other ones here? I have a special characteristic list, and these are the figs in here that have a superior, it seems like, or at least a, an above average drying capability. Some of them are better than others, but Neruciola de Elba, Moro de Caneva, Verdino del Nord, um, Marsa Lazy, um, De La Roca, Sucret. Uh, potentially even Campaneri, Carabaceta or Calabacita, depending on what you want to call it. Those figs have a very optimal, superior drying capability to them in that even in periods of light rain, um, higher humidity, they will dry. And because they've dried, as I mentioned just a moment ago, they have a superior flavor, a higher fruit quality, they have a higher bricks, they have a higher sugar content. Basically, the fig itself is creating the perfect environment 
for this fig to be preserved even in some of the worst conditions if it's if it's really raining outside and pouring um, I do find that some of these won't do necessarily as well as uh, as you'd hope but because they have such superior rain resistance what does that all mean how did that happen what separates the rain resistance from let's say Smith which is undoubtedly or let's say even Celeste which are undoubtedly some of the most rain resistant varieties why aren't my Smith and my Celeste drying up on the tree as easy as let's say my Neruccio de Elba and my Verdino del Nord and to give you a little bit of perspective these are like shockingly easily dried on the tree like stupidly easy um, it's really quite fascinating and um, it, it we're gonna get into a little bit more details about it but I I could even if I wanted to and I've, I've done this throughout the season is take them off the tree not dried and leave them on my counter and they will dry um, I don't even have to have them in the fridge I don't have to put them in a dehydrator they just have the right characteristics there's something in there that I think is a bit magical. I don't know what it is. Maybe they just have that right sugar content to prevent that mold, that fermentation from happening. Maybe they just have that perfect characteristic, uh, whatever that is. However, some are very obvious to me that separates again from Smith and Celeste as an example. So they don't split, that's number one. They never split. In fact, I've almost never, I don't think I would ever see one of these guys fully split open like you see some figs. They may split a little bit, um, but you're never going to see this one look like an alien where it's just like, a you know, the, the whole inside of the fig just opens up like this. Um, also, the cracking in the skin is really, really important. There is no cracking in the skin. And if I show you guys photos of these, these are like perfect figs there is no cracking where if I show you like the variety right next to it this is the Daloso which is also shriveled up on the tree in perfect conditions but you can definitely see right in here there's some cracking and this then inhibits in part and here's Sucret another one with very superior rain resistance very little cracking in this the eye is closed as well completely closed nothing's getting in nothing's attacking the fig um, and I'm able to get this drying capability here and if I show you some other ones here like this fig right up here this will never work it's got a big eye this is never going to dry up on the tree here LSU tiger even though it has great rain resistance I would say um, it also has good drying capabilities so does Celeste Celeste has pretty good drying capabilities however it does crack and these cracks are pretty common and then prevent the fig from really reaching that perfect dried state that can pretty much withstand anything and then also taste the best so that's really what your I think people overlook and they they don't really look at if I show you guys some photos um, this is a vlog that I want to use as an example of some figs that were picked over in Spain these are some ponds varieties and you can see looking at these um, all these different variety names and there's the figs with them um, and you can really get a good idea. Here is a fig called Algerina Negra. Um, or this is a good example right here. This is Al uh, Alicantina. It's a very well-known variety that dries very easily on the tree. Um, and you can see the differences. These are all picked pretty much on the same day or at least on a similar day and you can see sort of the differences if I while I go through this look how kind of like perfect the skin is on these and there's very little cracking there's some over here there's a little bit of damage there but these will very easily dry you can see the eye is pretty damn closed if not completely closed 
if I were to go through this list, like look at this one, DN Amaros, look at the cracking and the large fissures down the side of the fig. While this may be beautiful, here's an open eye, it doesn't lend itself well. This one actually is sort of dried up on the tree. You can see this cork tint to it. That's a sign that it was drying up. But it's got a big eye, which can be an issue. Here is a, a Ramada. You can see how big the eye is. The stripes are beautiful. The cracking's beautiful. But as I go through this, I mean, look how many cracks are in all these figs and large cracks at that. Um, look at all these. So this is obviously, in, in my mind, figs that have been picked after a rain. You can see some of them are wet. You can see some of them are probably picked at the end of the season. It's a bit cooler. This is what the figs would look like in my climate most of the time. Um, so I'm not really too fond of many of these varieties, as you can see. This one actually is pretty good, the Bordesote Negra. It has some cracking here, but for the most part, a closed eye. Not too many cracks, doesn't look too affected. Look at this variety, completely split open. You can see this right here looks like some fermentation happening on this side of the fig. Uh, this one's really bad. You can see large cracks, large fissures in the fig, also splitting, etc., etc. I think you guys get the deal. Call the Rona. This one's pretty bad. All these little cracks in the skin will allow the fig to ferment easier will allow the fig to spoil easier. No matter how high the bricks content is in the pulp, the fact that it's now exposed, it doesn't have that covering over it, we're now losing fruit quality uh, every day that goes by. And especially for somebody in my climate. So if I go back to the Alicantina, even this variety looks pretty, pretty decent. Um, and even this variety here, Algerina Negra. Um, and then the Alicantina. These really are the varieties that I'm looking for. And you may think, you know, let's like look look at this Ramada. Oh my god, it's got stripes on it. It looks really good. The pulp looks pretty good. The pulp on this one looks incredible. You know, uh the pulp on this one looks incredible. You know, um, you know, just because the pulp looks good and maybe it has some tasty remarks about it, it doesn't mean it's going to be tasty when you eat it. Because a lot of the time, you're not going to be able to, at least in my climate, pick these figs perfectly. You're not going to get them to this point. Or if you do, you're going to have trouble with this and it's not going to be consistent. So that's sort of my point here. This one's actually pretty bad with the amount of crackings in it. Um, and I actually have this variety and I've noticed that myself. So, you know, that's I think numero uno. And there's a couple things we can do. Um, first off, at the end of my season in the fall, when there's big temperature swings, that really contributes to that cracking. Um, certain varieties just do it more than others. This is Sweet Joy and you can see there's a crack down here on this side. This is really just what this variety does. This was picked at the same time these were. And this was picked on August 31st. This was the best, the highest fruit quality day of my season was August 31st last year. It doesn't matter. Sweet Joy is going to have this issue. Certain varieties do it. But again, at the end of the season, when we have our, our cooler weather, and also what tends to happen is that we have a very wild fluctuation in temperature. It can be 80 degrees uh, during the day, and then at night it can drop all the way down to 40. Um, I've seen all kinds of crazy temperature swings. When that big temperature swing happens, maybe it also has something to do with the atmospheric pressure. That creates more of these cracks in the skin. And you'll notice that after that happens, when you go outside the next day, you'll see a lot of them across the board have a lot of these cracks in it, except for these varieties that have superior drying capabilities. 
they don't seem to crack almost no matter what. They have a superior drying capability, okay? Another reason this can happen is excess nitrogen. If you feed your trees too much nitrogen throughout the season, um, it will contribute and you'll have excess cracking in the skin, therefore leading to lower fruit quality. So don't overfeed them. You need to get enough nitrogen for them to grow, put out healthy, new, vigorous growth to then set the main crop. Past that, you need to pretty much chill out with the nitrogen. Um, in fact, I only did four feedings this year, and I had the least amount of crackings I, cracking I've ever had in any other year um, because of that. I didn't really have any cracking up until about September 1st this year. And you can kind of go through some of my photos and really see that for yourself. There was a day sometime in August where it was kind of bad. But before most of this point here, it was very, very, very little cracking here. As you can kind of see in this photo, this variety had a little bit of minor cracking, minor cracking, minor cracking. I think there was a bit of rain on that day. Well, there's more cracking than, uh, than I would uh, have expected. But the point is, is that I really didn't have a whole lot of cracking compared to other years. That's def that's a definite. And it really has to do with the feeding. Um, Pons mentions that in his book. Uh, we talk about it a lot in the fig community, et cetera, et cetera. And here's another one. This is Azores Dark. I would consider one of my best figs. It is in my top five. It does have this drying capability to it, but you can see these cracks. And it just doesn't have that next level to it of drying. Here's the Neruciola de Elba right next to Azores Dark, Azores Dark Neruciola de Elba. And you can see that um, over time there is just certain figs that do this better than others and there's really only a handful that I've come across. So that's number one. That's like a mind, a new mind-blowing thing that I had never really considered. I think a lot of people don't really consider it because they've never experienced this for themselves. Until you grow Verdino del Nord, Neruciola de Elba, Sucret from Bode, De La Roca, uh, Marsa Lazy, um, Carabaceta, um, what are some other ones here that I have on my list? Maybe even Campaneri, um, Col Noir, right? And Moro de Caneva. Until you grow one of those and you see the drying capability for yourself and are able to compare those to all your other figs, it's not really going to click, unfortunately. And I wish someone had told me this six years ago, right? I wish somebody had done this video for me and said, you know what, Ross? I, we live in a similar place. I've been growing figs for six years now. I find the best ones that do well here are actually the ones that dry up on the tree, even in the worst conditions. So um, yeah, that's, that's like the biggest piece of advice of this video. The second characteristic that I look for, and um, this is about it. After this, this is really it. It's really only the, the ripening period, um, at least the main characteristics I look for. The ripening period, um, whether or not it has a lot of cracking, drying capabilities, split resistance, resistance to rain, it all kind of ties into that one thing there. But the last important point is the hang time. And you'll never hear anybody else other than me even mention hang time in the fig community. I don't know why people still are not using this term. Um, but it's basically in any fruits vocabulary uh, or definition in any fruit is really just how long the, the piece of fruit hangs on the tree for. And um, at least in the figs case and the way I like to look at it is when the fig is starting to ripen. So from green and hard on the tree that's inedible and then it starts to turn color and starts to swell and starts to get soft and starts to uh, become edible. Um, how many days did it take from that green point there or the beginning point of the swelling process to then perfectly ripe? 
you count the number of days, you get a nice little estimate in your head, whatever you want to do, you can write it down, you can tally it, you can keep track of it in a calendar, I don't know. But the lower that number, the better in this particular climate um, by a long shot. And that number is greatly affected by where you live, what the, the heat is in your climate, um, the day length as well. Um, overall, if you have more heat throughout the day, whether it's because of day length or whether it's just because it's warmer out, let's say you're in the south versus the north, you're going to have figs that ripen, have a shorter hang time than somewhere like me. Uh, because our temperatures at night maybe might dip into the 60s or even into the 50s, that really slows down the metabolism of our trees. We want to have the root temperatures consistently around 78 degrees Fahrenheit, 80 degrees, somewhere definitely over 75. If we have those consistent root temperatures, we're going to have the tree performing at its optimal metabolism. Just like us as humans, we have a certain temperature that we like to perform at and we perform the best at. Insects, the same thing. Dinosaurs, they're cold-blooded. They don't like the wintertime. Insects don't like the wintertime either. So therefore, they're not outside in the wintertime. They're not flying around. So it's the same thing with the fig. If we can just simply make our fig tree warm, we'll have that shorter hang time. But we don't always have that luxury and even some varieties will have a different hang time depending on the genetics. It's not all in the heat. A lot of it has to do with the genetics. Also, certain varieties have adapted to colder places. So even if it does have a lower metabolism, let's say our metabolism is at 65 degrees Fahrenheit, then certain varieties will still be able to perform well at that temperature and still be able to have a shorter hang time at that temperature. Once the nighttime temperatures though really start to significantly drop, the number of days dramatically increases. And you'll notice this guys in your fall. You need to pay attention to this in your fall season. Maybe you guys are in Southern California, pay attention in January or I should say November and December. How long does it take for them to ripen? That's sort of what I deal with on a consistent basis. So I need to have figs that ripen with that shorter hang time for one reason. I mean, if you guys lived in a, a, a dry climate like Southern California, you could have a longer hang time and it wouldn't make that big of a difference. You just wait longer to pick it, right? Well, here it rains a lot. It rains probably on average, maybe a little bit, at least once a week some sort of rain and if it's raining on average i if i my by estimation some sort of precipitation every seven days that means if i have a fig that has a hang time of more than seven days let's say it's 10 days we're really going to struggle with ripening that fig to the perfect fruit quality to getting a consistent fruit quality right that's the name of the game consistent fruit quality here so a variety like Suwati, which I really enjoyed in the past, I finally got rid of it, or I should say I got rid of it, and I was very reluctant to do so, but because it was one of my favorites for such a long time. But I realized that the hang time on that fig is very long. It's over 10 days. It has to hang on the tree for about 12-ish to 15 days for it to be, in my mind, perfect. It has a big eye as well. And between those two characteristics, that just isn't gonna cut it here. Because if it if it rains, well, there is some figs, as I mentioned, right? Verdino del Nord, Neruciola de Elba, Sucret. Even if it's lightly raining outside, they're gonna still continue to dry up on the tree, right? So there are some figs that will do that, but it's just too long of a period, 12 days, 10 days is just too long. Even eight days is approaching uh, too long of a hang time. So for me, I'm looking for figs that are around that 
really four to seven day mark. If they're not in four to seven days, um, they're really starting to lose points. And I'll give you a great example, another one. White Triana, one of my favorite figs, takes about 10 to 12 to 15 days before it's perfect. Um, Azores Dark takes about eight days before it starts to shrivel up on the tree. Uh, De La Roca takes about seven days before it shrivels up on the tree. Italian 258 takes only about six or seven days before it's perfect, maybe even less than that. Um, well, you know what? And some of these figs aren't going to dry up on the tree. You know, if you think about it, there's the day, the amount of time it takes for it to be ripe. Then there's an extra time it takes for it to be dry, right? It's an additional process. Once the fruit reaches its peak ripeness, it then starts to turn in the other direction and going towards dry. So it takes a longer time for it to dry, but I have figs like, let's say, Moro de Caneva, which takes maybe eight days to dry or seven days to dry. Verdino del Nord, which takes about six days to dry. Nuricio de Elba takes six days to be dried on the tree. That's six days, guys. That's a huge deal. Um, you know, then you've got figs like, like I said, White Triana, some of these others that just, like even Delson Wami Gran seems to take quite a bit of time. Um, I do find that Rasty's Persian I, Unknown or Iranian Candy is very quick. LSU Champagne is maybe only three or four days and it's ready to be picked. Rasty's like three or four days. Um, Yellow Nietzsche's is pretty quick. Um, De La Senora Hivernenka is pretty quick. Um, you know, there's a number of these varieties with a short, short hang time, and those are the ones that are getting the big points here. Those are the ones that are going to be able to have a higher consistent fruit quality um, over time. So um, that's also why I sort of like Italian 258 is that it's really under or just at that seven day mark. So most of the time you're going to get fruits that will ripen either in that two, even in that window of no rain. Let's say you have rain on day one and then somewhere on day nine. Um, you know, if it ripens in between that with no rain or very little rain, you're going to have good fruit quality. Um, so those are really three really important characteristics here. Another one, just as a bonus, that I've been finding is that the... Uh, it's not well you should also mention it's not just when they ripen right so the first thing we talked about was the ripening period is it early is it mid-season is it late but that's the first fig of the year what about the the figs that ripen at the end of the year the very last fig to ripen when does the last fig ripen so you've got some in the beginning and then some at the end what is that entire crop window how long did that take when is that being uh, ripening in your season in terms of the date around September 15th things start to go downhill in terms of fruit quality because of our lower metabolisms our cooler nights decrease the metabolisms of our trees we have less sugar content um, more cracking etc etc so we need to pay attention to the last the date of the last fig as well but one thing I think is uh, is not ever really talked about is the amount of figs that ripen at one time. Some varieties will ripen one fig at one time, get it to that perfect ripeness, then you pick it. The next fig is now starting to ripen. Some figs will ripen, uh, you know, five or six at the same time. And this is all variety dependent. I find that the varieties like, as an example, LSU Scott's Black ripens a lot of figs at once. Taramo Unknown ripens a lot of figs at once. This can be either a very good thing or a very bad thing. It can be very bad if they ripen all at once. If there is a period of lots of rain, let's say we have a weak period of rain, it's possible. I've had many seasons now where we've had like a four to five to six day stretch of rain nonstop. 
whatever ripened during that time was like pretty much completely ruined. Um, and if I have six or seven figs on the tree that are ripening at that time, I'm losing a lot of my crop at one time because they're all ripening at once. So I personally would rather have them a bit spread out. I'd rather have a, a, a larger crop window, but you don't want that last fig to be too late in the season because if, again, if it's too late in the season, you have lower fruit quality. So it's kind of a give and take there. It's a little bit of, uh, you know, a lot of character, a lot of factors that goes into the absolute perfect variety. And I think we're getting very close to what that is. Um, we very definitively have a great top 10 list that I'm very proud of. Um, so yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this one. I hope you guys got something out of it, some good perspective. Check us out on figboss.com. That's our blog. Uh, follow us on Facebook and Instagram, also on Facebook. Share this video if you guys thought it was helpful. You know somebody who's interested in growing different fig varieties. Uh, share this one with them. Thank you guys. We'll talk to you soon. Take care, everybody.